Aloha. Aloha. We're going to go ahead and get started. I know there's probably going to be some stragglers coming in, but that's all right. Um, you know, we're running a little late. Um, I just wanted to, first of all, thank all of you for coming. This is our first social media club uh, event of 2012. And um, I'm really excited about this night. This tonight. We have an awesome panel. Derek's going to pull up uh, our, uh, one of our other panelists in just a minute. We have an awesome panel here. Super, super smart people. On your table are three car are cards, red, yellow, and green. That is to encourage you to interrupt the conversation. In the spirit of social media, the disruptive technology, you may hold up your cards, ask questions, um, you know, not with the finger. What was that all about? Um, <laughs> so we want you to ask questions to the panel. I have a bunch of questions I'm going to ask them, but if I'm not asking those questions that you really want to know, you are in charge. Um, I want to thank Hagenon. Uh, where are you? There you are, Jason. They are our uh, event venue sponsor. Without them, this venue would cost all of you a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much for your ongoing support. Yes. Uh, I also want to announce that we elected a new board of directors in uh, 2012. So. There are a couple board of directors that are not in the room. One is Roxanne Darling, who a lot of you know. She is on the live stream. Uh, Laura Kimishita, she is also on the li live stream from the Big Island. And if you are a board of directors, could you, a board of director, could you please stand? Because, thank you all, Derek's already standing, thank you. Uh, without these people, these events don't happen. And it's an all volunteer based organization, so we thank them for their time and efforts in planning. It was a little crazy this afternoon for everybody, so, but everybody powered through it. And if you're a professional member of Social Media Club, could you please stand up? Excellent. These are your stand up, stand up, stand up. It's not an exercise program, just go ahead and stand up. These are uh, Social Media Club professional members and small business members. They are committed to not only the best practices of social media and helping all of the businesses of what you find ways to make social media work for them, but they are also uh, have put their money where their mouth is, and they also make this event happen tonight. So please thank them as well. Go ahead. Okay. We're going to go ahead and get started. Sylvia, can you hear me okay? I sure can. Woo! Aloha, everyone. Sylvia Dolby is one of our professional members. She is on the Big Island joining us. Um, I'm going to do a quick introduction to, for our uh, panelists here and then ask them to do an introduction of themselves. And so we'll start with Sylvia and then go to Connie. Okay, guys? Uh, so Connie Harper is a mediator and of uh, Harper Strategies. She has a significant background both in law and human resources. She's also a professional member of Social Media Club. And um, she is really good on the fly, so you can ask her all kinds of questions. Ryan K. Hugh, attorney at law. He is, you probably have seen him in the social media space. He's kind of, uh, <laughs> by, by default, inserted himself into a number of circumstances where we all wanted advice from, from uh, a lawyer, and, 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 and we kind of seem to be turning to Ryan quite a bit for that these days. And David Bauer, all trust, brings to us a wealth of information. All trust did a uh, white paper a couple of years ago. I think you brought some copies with you, right? Um, about social media in the workplace. And he's going to talk about some of the burning issues with respect to National uh, Labor Board uh, relations. That is obviously a, a significant topic where we're talking about social media policy. So I'm going to turn over to the panel. I'm going to turn off my mic. If you have a question, you know what to do. And I will come to you. Okay, we're going to start with Sylvia. Sylvia, go ahead. Hi, everybody. Aloha from the Big Island. It's uh, Malasada Day, so what I'd like to know is, are there those mini Malasadas on hand? Because I'm thinking about them. No. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for coming. And uh, I am uh, actually a vendor of an applicant tracking system and a relatively late adopter of social media, as it's called today. But I work virtually. 
And one of the reasons I'm back here in Hawaii is because I lived on the mainland for many years for work, and the technology finally caught up with me. I've worked at home since 1990, and I've relied very heavily on technology to communicate with clients, my employer, <laughs> and anybody else that needed uh, to be I needed to be in contact with. So social media has opened up uh, another level of uh, internet communications, but it, even though it's kind of new. What my mission is to try and demystify it now for folks here in Hawaii because it's made it possible for me to come back and work for a company that's based out of San Diego and also work with my customers who are employers, they're recruiters and corporate HR people that are trying to find ways to leverage social media in their business. And the topic of social media policy keeps coming up again and again. So I'm very grateful of this opportunity to talk with you a little bit about that. So, Tara, is that what you were looking for, <laughs> for an introduction? I really didn't prepare that speech. Okay, great. So, uh, as I say, what I'd like to do is kind of put this in the context of, uh, let's talk practical here. Once upon a time, long ago in a galaxy far, far away, the telephone itself was an impossible idea. Hold on. And, oh, I'm sorry? Hold on. I'm going to let the rest of the panel do that quick. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Can you hear me okay? <laughs> this is the power of social media, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Connie. <laughs> Thanks, Sylvia, for keeping it. Go ahead, Connie. Thanks, okay. Sylvia and Tara. Um, <laughs> so I am the person who I have uh, designated myself as the expert on what happens where social media intersects with HR. And I gave myself that uh, dubious title based on 35 years as a labor and employment lawyer uh, on the mainland, where I, in that course of 35 years, represented almost every possible configuration of client. Uh, I represented employers, I represented labor unions, I represented plaintiffs, I represented defendants, individuals, corporations. So I've seen it all from every angle. and. Then I moved to Hawaii just as the social media uh, phenomenon exploded. And it occurred to me that, oh, here's something that really brings everything together in one place and calls to bear everything I've ever learned or ever known. Uh, so my major focus is that in these days of the social media explosion, which we can expect will only get bigger and bigger, uh, it's important for anyone who either has employees or independent contractors to have a written policy uh, about how social media is or is not to be used with your equipment and then train people and then walk the talk and enforce your policy. Okay, go ahead, Ryan. Thanks. Yeah, good evening, everybody. How are you all? <laughs> anyway, um, yes, I am unfortunately an attorney, although I think we have several other attorneys here. Anyway, um, I got into social media largely because um, the legal practice is notorious from running away from um, technological innovation, whether it was the fax machine, email, and everything. So I really saw an opportunity because um, I do a lot of... Um, pro bono doing access to justice things, of educating people about what the law is. And many of you who might follow my blog know that I do Draw the Law, which is where I doodle and sketch legal concepts out so that people can understand them. Um, that being said, with social media, I think there's this kind of complexity that people add to it when it doesn't really need to be that complex. And that simplicity is really key in having a good social media policy. And so um, as a contracts and kind of compliance attorney, I help people with that for risk management kind of situations. Uh, my name is David. I'm here representing the Altra's family of companies, which includes Altra Staffing, Simplicity HR by Altra's, and Kila Kila Employer Services, which are uh, outsourced human resource services here in Hawaii, and then most recently, uh, realjobshawaii.com, which some of you might have discovered already. 
Um, I am neither a lawyer or a trained HR professional, so anything that comes out of my mouth here this evening is for edutainment purposes only. Um, I'm glad that we've got experienced people up here on the panel and Sylvie behind me. So um, just to give a little context about why the Altrus companies are involved uh, in this realm, um, because we're responsible, f we are the virtual HR department for over 800 employers in Hawaii. And by association, we're responsible for the care and feeding of over 8,000 worksite employees statewide. So we are the HR department for a lot of people, and we have to keep on top of best practices in HR, but also technology as well. We publish white papers for our clients periodically, and then we make those available to Hawaii businesses at large. And two years ago, we published Social Media in the Workplace, um, which took a different tact on social media than all the hype at the time. At the time, people were just in such a frenzy that you had to be on Facebook, you had to be tweeting, and if you weren't, your business was doomed. Um, so because there was this growing... Um, you know, this, this, the growing trend was everything was moving mobile and social. We wanted to be uh, Akamai and on the edge, on the cutting edge of understanding how it's affecting the workplace. So this was mainly published for employers just to give them a heads up because a lot of people were focused on the, the marketing and sales aspect of social media, and we wanted to bring it back to the workplace and say there's some other considerations that you should at least be aware of. So um, this is so 2010 this white paper, um, but I gave it a read over the weekend, and there's still a lot of uh, really uh, good basic information here. We brought some copies for you. Uh, you can take away, so glad to be here. Thank you. All right, we're going to roll straight into the questions. So now you guys know a little bit about our panel. You know that they rock. So I'm going to ask all of you a couple of questions. Um, I, I'm really interested in knowing from each of you in your respective professions, um, and I'm going to start with you, David, and we'll go down the line and then to Sylvia. Um, are you seeing an increased demand about social media policy? Are you seeing people asking more questions? And uh, kind of, if you are, why do you think it's coming up now? Absolutely, we're, we're getting more requests. Two years ago when we published this, this white paper, our, our clients weren't asking us about it, but raising the awareness and two years on, uh, we're getting regular requests to help them. So we'll give them some guidance, but ultimately refer them to their attorney because there are other considerations. What's the impetus, do you think? Why are they asking more questions now than they were two years ago when we published that white paper? Well, people are seeing that everyone's mobile and connected to social media. I mean, some people have asked, you know, what's the future of mobile? What's the future of social? And mobile social is the Internet. It is the way we're communicating. So employers were starting to notice that it was, you know, was happening in the workplace, and so they started asking, you know, questions. How do I control this? Um, I work with a lot of small businesses and startups, and it's not even a question of should they have a social media marketing plan. They, it's just already built in. For many of them, if they're young, they're, it's, it's already part of their daily lives. So I just kind of get a lot of questions about stumbling into legal landmines more so than should I have a social media marketing plan. But we're past that stage, and I think it's clear that um, it's here to stay in some way or shape or form, and everybody needs to grapple with it. Well, yeah, there's no question that the number of people who are using social media has increased exponentially in the last few years. Um, some experts have said that the percentage of people who are using Facebook has increased 43% since 2009. And others have uh, observed that a new member joins LinkedIn every second. Wow. So more people are using social media uh, more people are spending more time using it. I read something uh, the other day that said that uh, addiction to Facebook is more severe than addiction to certain drugs. Uh, so with that increased amount of use, you can, account, you can be sure that your employees or your independent contractors are going to be using it at work whether their job duties require it or not. And that is why it's important that employers have some kind of policy that's 
they train people on so that that can be regulated and everyone can be happy. Well, of course they want to know what's going on with social media because uh, the use of it, as the other speakers have pointed out, has grown exponentially. But I want to, you know, kind of hearken back to history because once upon a time the phone was new and people needed to have policies in place restricting the use of the phone for personal reasons at work. Then along came the Internet. Anybody remember when Al Gore first invented it? And then all of a sudden we had email. And this was deja vu, right? Like people uh, had to come up with uh, policies for using company email and company communication and lay down ideas that you can't communicate, you know, X-rated jokes or racist innuendo and you can't be sitting there at your desk surfing porn all day. So this, we've been here before and I can't stress this enough. Uh, the only reason this seems all new like a shiny object is it is going to pose new challenges in the mobile workplace and the, in the virtual workplace, which I'm a member of. So there are new challenges, but the challenges are the same challenges that you faced when the internet hit when everybody all of a sudden had email and could communicate at the speed of light, and even when the phone itself came out. So I think the reason it's coming up now is because a lot of people simply don't understand what it is and what it can do, and that one uh, part of my mission is to help uh, give you ideas on how to put it in the proper context so that you can come up with a coherent policy that's in line with policies that already exist for Internet and email communication. I can speak to that if you like. Um, my uh, opinion is that you should have a basic uh, social media policy that covers use of all company-owned equipment. Uh, when you say electronic equipment as a distinction, I'm not sure what that means, but your policy should be all-inclusive. And then I think you should further customize the policy for different categories of employees. So for example, I think you have a basic policy that cuts across job titles. Everyone has the same core. And then if you have someone whose duties actually require them to go on the internet, they have a, a specialized set of rules and regulations as compared to someone whose job duties do not require them to be on the internet. But what you can count on is that they will while at work on your computer. So you want to have policies in, in place that addresses that uh, probability. And then you also want to have a, a different set for uh, the HR department and specifically lay out how you want the HR function to use the internet. And then you also want to have another fourth category for people who are managers and supervisors. I'd just like to add to that is that because social media is kind of very pervasive, um, I, I kind of like it when corporate culture matches its, its insides match its outsides. So I'd only recommend, I know you were only thinking about internally as into the company, but you also want to think about your external, your, your stakeholders, your customers and stuff like that. Because if you're creating all these rules and policies internally for employees and they may be interacting as uh, Connie said with the internet you know you want those policies on the outside so when people hit your landing page your website or interact with you on Twitter if you're using that as a method of communication that 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 matches the insides so that there's a kind of a seamless kind of policy rather than you have mismatched policies across the board and it does vary on the kind of company it does, it does vary on the kind of company and culture. There's not one size 
fits all. I mean, some companies can get away with 10 bullet points, very simple, straightforward, um, and some would require the sophistication, uh, as, as Connie suggested. One of the challenges that we've come across, too, is that um, you need to address what happens at work but also outside of work. And it's not just people doing personal uh, interactions after work hours, but you've got exempt employees who are um, doing their job seven days a week and at evenings and weekends, and, and you know what they do on the, on the Internet or what they do socially uh, needs to be addressed as well. I have a couple things to add, and I think that, uh, was that David that raised that point? Is um, that you, the social media is already being used, both in business and personal context, and we're very much starting to see this blending. We used to talk about work-life balance, and now we talk about work-life blend. And I think an important element of the social media policy, and I am in agreement with Connie that you definitely can have different layers of policy depending on the job description, and what role that person plays in the company. But the idea being is that you need some kind of code and co code of conduct, if you will, that would be appropriate so that your employees aren't using social media to, say, start bashing other employees or bashing the company in social media. You can say that that's going to be grounds for dismissal. Um, or just like, I mean, I'm going to use some analogies here. Like, let's say you have a driver of your you know, company cars, you have a code of conduct for when they're out there in public driving around in the company car. And if they get picked up for DUI, even if it's on their own time, that's probably grounds for dismissal because they no longer have a clean record. So you need to put forth some appropriate measures depending on how public facing that employee is and how much access they have to what might be proprietary information. Like if you're working for the FBI, you're not supposed to talk about that stuff to anybody in a bar. And in, in essence, I think, and I'm going to leave this to the lawyers among us here, but I think social media policy is going to be very much like how you would expect your, your people to, to comport themselves in a public place. Because many of these online communities, they simply are public places. So people are joining them to congregate with their peers. I mean, hey, in the room right now, we've got members of the Social Media Club. We've got members of SHRM Hawaii. We've got members of the Chamber of Commerce. I mean, how many of these groups are you in? Everything you do is touching some kind of social network. And the policy that you create, whether it's for someone that represents your company, like in a marketing capacity, or whether it's just an employee, should be appropriate to whatever your rules are for managing information that is maybe part of the organization, as well as just comporting yourself as a representative of that organization. It's going to touch all different functions, and so your policy is probably going to have to address some of those, some of those additional issues. Which if, the other thing is, is that just so you guys all know, we're, we'll do a post cap of tonight's event, and I do have some sample policies that I'm going to post on the social media club website. Some of them are military, which I think is fantastic because the military examples are open and available to the public, but they t they obviously have some very distinctive needs. And, and as well as making it very clear what the expectations are. So there's some really great examples that we'll be posting on the social media club, and I'm going to turn it over to the audience question here. Oh, this question can I answer? God, you guys are so great. Go ahead, honey. I'd like to uh, comment and expand on one of the comments that Sylvia made. Um, Sylvia said um, brilliantly, by the way, that you want to have, a, that a lot of employers have policies that prohibit employees from disparaging or trashing uh, coworkers and have been enforcing those kinds of policies. I just want to let you know that that kind of policy has been the source or the impetus for what has become some of the major federal regulations related to social media policies uh, that are in place right now. Um, specifically, uh, how it, the fact situations that t 
typically have come to litigation is someone has a Facebook page, they go on their Facebook page and they make a comment about a coworker or a supervisor. Uh, typically when it's a supervisor, it's a big trouble. Um, someone at work sees it, um, maybe uh, coworkers see it and chime in and agree or like the comment on Facebook. Uh, someone at work sees that and the original poster gets disciplined uh, up to and including discharged for making the comment on their Facebook page that violated the company policy that prohibited disparaging supervisors. Uh, that fact situation is what was the impetus for the National Labor Relations Board weighing in on company social media policies. Uh, so in a real case that happened, that person was fired. She went to the National Labor Relations Board and filed a complaint. Now let me just say as an aside, for those of you who are thinking, well, our company does not have a union so I'm not even going to listen to this, you should listen because those are the companies that have ten tended to be the target of uh, this kind of action by the National Labor Relations Board. Uh, so this woman went to the board, filed a complaint claiming that her termination was in violation of her rights for protected concerted activity uh, guaranteed by the National Labor Relations Act. And the board agreed with her and uh, made it a very difficult place for that company to, I mean, it, Long story short, she was reinstated and given back pay, uh, even though she did violate the company policy that prohibited disparaging coworkers because the National Labor Relations Board allows people to talk among themselves about their uh, terms and conditions of employment. And her negative comment about her supervisor was deemed to have fallen into that category of content. So. There are a couple of things that you can do to avoid that problem in the future, like lessons learned from that fact situation include, number one, not having a phrase that says that specifically, but number two, include in your policy a statement saying that the policy is not intended to conflict with federal, state, or local law. And that way, if, it, if you do have the language in your policy saying don't disparage coworkers, and someone does do it, you can avoid uh, facing penalties by the NLRB by having language saying, oh, we didn't intend to interfere with her, her rights for a concerted protected activity. Uh, so that provision can be as simple as the second bullet point that I have on my handout in case you didn't see it. Uh, you can have your policy say, don't disparage coworkers, and then also have it say, the policy is not intended to interfere in any way with applicable federal, state, and federal, and local laws, and you're out of the hot okay, water. Hold on a second, we do have a question in the live stream. Kind of. <laughs> the sound like you see the questions uh, as they're being asked. Um, the question was a little bit more geared from a legal aspect, but um, Laura from the Big Island and Roxanne, um, from Maui, both uh, professional members um, and on the board, are asking about, um, well, they particularly asked Ryan if you're familiar with any case law on this, but going to uh, what she said is that um, talking bad about a company or an employer is a freedom of the First Amendment, so it's protected by freedom of speech. So do you know that that's typically? Well, let, let's back up. I'm yeah. gonna jump off of uh, Connie's thing and She's, she actually, she, she, she gave you guys a lot of information, which is a good thing, but first of all, she's absolutely right, is that the National Labor Relations Board does affect private employers with or without unions. Um, what, what it falls under is the Na uh, National Labor Relations Act does apply to employees that they can talk about their conditions, their wages, and all of those things. And what she was referring to in, in legalese speak, we, um, when you get a group of workers together and they start complaining and griping about, I can't stand work, I have terrible hours, I have low pay, and all of that, they are actually protected because that is considered a protected concerted activity where they can talk about 
those things of issue. Um, getting back to it, um, the uh, National Labor Relations Board has had many um, instances of what Connie was talking about, and I believe they just issued a report in January right, um, for seven cases that they decided, and most of it was stemming mainly from Facebook. Um, with that being said, you know, I think the concern is, is, oh my God, my employees are running out there and complaining the hell out of me. It was like, no, um, mere complaining is not protected. They can, they, you can actually fire somebody for griping, and it's just kind of, it's kind of nebulous, and it's a very, it's a fine gray line, but, you know, if they're just, pardon my language, bitching and complaining, then, you know, that's one thing. If they're actually making kind of statements about, like I said, wages, um, length of time that they're working, their bosses being overly harsh or not listening to them, then yes, that, 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 that might fall into the other category where that's protected. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I have a question. Yes. I have a question for you, Ryan. What's up? And uh, I was wondering if you saw that article in the New York Times. Um, one of the correspondents, Roland Martin, got suspended uh, from the Times for posting a very controversial um, comment yes. on Twitter. Uh, even though he, this is a guy that's paid to post his opinions on Twitter for CNN, he made a very flip remark during the Super Bowl about David Beckman and his underwear. Yeah. And this was construed as gay bashing, which was against the CNN policy. So I'm, uh, you know, free speech aside, right? I think there are some things that, uh, you know, are can, can be construed as maybe giving other legal exposure to the company. So where do you draw the line there between free speech and something that is just, you just can't do that and work here? I'm glad you asked that. And like any good attorney, I'm going to say it depends. <laughs> 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 I'm just kidding. Um, that being said, you know, if you hire us, and I'm glad we're getting into that because we probably want to touch upon independent contractor and hired marketers for your social media policy, but Anyway, taking a step back to that, when you have somebody and they're on the payroll and they're there to be your public relations and marketing, if they dump, damage your credibility among the stakeholders and populace, there will be a backlash of some sort. So, you know, you kind of have to put your trust and get them to understand, and this is where training ed education comes in, of... This is a tool, it's a very powerful tool, and you have a huge outreach of you know, thousands, if not millions of people, especially in Roland Martin's case. Um, they are going to demand blood and meat if they feel offended. I mean, there is also the ESPN commentator who made a comment about Jeremy Lin, I believe, on their Twitter feed as well. The, a lot of these advocacy and organization groups, and this, I speak from this from a legislative kind of point of view as well, is, is that they will, they will clamor for something and you do need to take some sort of action or risk looking like you're not doing anything. I just, I'm going to interrupt really quick if you don't have any question. I'm starting to answer. No. Okay. <laughs> hey, uh, great conversation. It's a question certainly for all of you, maybe specifically for Connie. Uh, and my question is, 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 you know, listening to this, this is definitely an educational uh, conversation and, and more so from the recruiting aspect. What in a two-part question? So, what are you doing for employees that are already inside internally to educate them um, it, it, about the policies versus just providing a policy for them to read? And then, second part question is, what are you doing in the recruiting process to make sure that they're aware of these types of cultures and processes before they even come on board? It's part of the onboard process. Um, well, with regard to your existing employees, uh, it's my recommendation that you develop a training program that's interactive, that includes that every employee attends, uh, you take attendance and you document that they were there or not, and that it's interactive in that it gives examples of kinds, you know, fact situations for scenarios. Maybe you have role playing, have people get involved, have everyone ask every question that they have in their mind rather than just sitting on their questions. 
so that you get everything up and out and have everyone understand that there are ramifications for things that you say and do, particularly on the internet. Uh, so that's the kind of training that I recommend that you have and that everybody go through. Um, and what we're finding, uh, as a matter of fact, Cisco released a study around the first of the year where they did a survey of uh, people under age 30, actually under age 25, who are in college or uh, working to find out what their uh, attitudes are toward the internet and job searching. And one of the surprising results that that study showed uh, was that job applicants are more concerned about social media use and social media flexibility and social media policies than they are about how much money you are going to pay them. So in the recruiting and hiring phase, what you can expect is that applicants will be asking and they will in part base their decisions on whether or not to accept your offer on what answer you give them. Uh, so that's why I'm saying that you should expect that you're going to have people who are working for you who will want to have flexible social media policies, flexible social media use, and your policy should be designed to be able to accommodate that and have everyone get along. This is an awesome lead into the next question, which is, I, I shared with the panel earlier this week, uh, there was a circumstance with the American Red Cross where one of their young professionals um, accidentally tweeted from the wrong account about getting slizzard uh, and mentioning a particular uh, alcohol within that tweet. And so, and this is only one case, obviously, of thousands we hear about all the time. What I found interesting about this case is immediately following that, probably within a half an hour, I think, uh, that tweet was deleted, and a tweet went out from American Red Cross that said, we have deleted the rogue tweet, and you can rest assured the keys have been removed, and there are no more drunk tweets. <laughs> so they had a little bit of a sense of humor about it, and then play was not fired, by the way. So my question is, is, you know, we've seen all kinds of examples of employers dealing with these kinds of misfires. They happen. People are imperfect. So how should a social media policy enable the employer or company to uh, address the different threats, if for lack of a better word, or the different uh, levels of, of, of impact that a particular social media post might have? And it might be from somebody who's actually managing their account, but it also might be from, from just a person speaking out about their company who isn't quote unquote authorized to speak. Who wants to handle it first? Well, I'll, I'll attack it. Okay. <laughs> uh, so really what you're pointing to actually looks at the intersection of HR and social media. Because what you're really asking is, what's the best way for a company to merge its progressive disciplinary system with violations of the social media policy? And um, I think that, in a word, the way to do that is gently. Um, the purpose of progressive discipline is to give an employee, number one, notice of what's expected and what's not expected, and number two, an opportunity to improve their behavior and their performance. Uh, that's why uh, in labor uh, management relations, we refer to termination as the capital punishment of employment. Uh, you want to make termination the very, 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 very last straw. Uh, I'm a strong believer in many steps of progressive discipline. And you look at what happened and what the circumstances are and the person's background, their history, and, you know, it may be that um, for this person at the Red Cross, all that she should have received was just a warning. Please be careful in the future when you're tweeting that you use the right account because you know, we are the Red Cross and people 
you know, we have a, a, a corporate brand we're trying to maintain, and she would have said, okay, I will, I'm so sorry, and then that's the end of it. Uh, I'm, I'm so glad they did not terminate her employment over this because, in my opinion, it's not a dischargeable offense. You know, this, um, I have a, uh, something I'd like to add to that. And, Connie, I think that that's really great uh, because it leads into something that I feel very strongly about. Um, there's a lot of chatter about how online communication, whether it's email, whether it's, you know, chat rooms or social media and so forth, has becoming um, very uncivil and rude. And it's very easy to fire off a flame when you're just sitting in front of your PC and you're not looking at someone face to face. And so we're starting to lose simple courtesy. And I don't think people need to be fired unless they do something really egregious that actually hurts the company in some way. And I really hope that we see this as an opportunity to start injecting some common sense into our social media policy and educating society that, you know, we, we could all do with some better manners. Um, I have three M's that I want to impart. And if you don't learn anything else from me today, this is the most important thing that I tell everybody when they're using social media is remember the three M's. The three M's are your mom. Right? Don't put anything, post anything, say anything on a social network that you don't want your mom to see. The second M is the media. I mean, do I have to tell you what happened with Senator Weiner and, you know, everybody else that did something terrible, like that guy in the tiger suit? Okay? Just don't do that because you're in a public place. Because the third M is your mentors, and that means everybody else, right? Your neighbors and so on and so forth. You want to express an opinion, fine. Some opinions are better expressed in private, and social media is not the place for that. So I think it's an education process, and that employers are uniquely positioned to kind of help, uh, let's just say, improve the manners of society by what they'll tolerate in terms of civil behavior. Let's be kinder. Let's be polite. Let's practice professional behavior in public spaces. And remember the, that these are the best rules for social media engagement is to be polite. Um, the only other thing I want to add is that uh, the Rotarians have a lovely, I'm not a Rotarian, but I know a lot of them, and, and maybe there's some in the room there, but they have kind of a code. It's called the four-way test, and it says, first, is it the truth, right? If it's, is it the truth? Whatever you say on a social site, is it true, right? Second, is it fair? Right? Maybe you are trashing somebody, but if it's fair, <laughs> right? It's true, it's fair, okay? But the third rule is, will it build goodwill? And the fourth rule, is it beneficial? And I think if we started asking ourselves these questions before we posted something in a public place, that we would have a kinder society and we would have a happier workplace because people would just generally be nicer. They'd have better manners. That's, that's it. Okay, and I wanted to just thank you for giving me the opportunity to throw that out there because right. <laughs> we need to be nicer in social places. So here we have the balance of common sense manners, the very same manners that we all grew up knowing, and uh, some, some common sense kind of behavior. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to swing it back and ask Brian and David, you two, to uh, specifically address this. But, you know, again, I'm going to go back to asking what are some laws or policies that are already in existence, whether it's labor board relations or, or, uh, or legal considerations that are already in effect that impact social media policies. Dave, do you want to start? Or do you want to well, let, actually, I, so, sorry, Dave. No. I, I just wanted to go back to what uh, Connie and Sylvia said based on the, um, just really short, really short. <laughs> um, you know, one of the salient features about the, uh, the firings and the complaints about the, uh, those seven cases I mentioned is they, they Facebooked once and it was one post and then they got fired. So, you know, going along what they said, it's an edu your discipline process is an education process and the severity of the punishment should match the, uh, the problem. I mean, can you imagine just Facebooking once and then posting once and then, oh, you're fired. Oh, of course, of course the, the former employee is going to be angry and what are they going to do? They're going to take it out on you. So it's better to educate them along the way and then when you, if they do continue to mess up, that they believe that the firing is their fault because they just didn't follow policy that you educated them on. Rather than this like trying to use a nuke to hit a fly kind of problem that many of these other unfortunate employers took. But going back to David and going back to Tara's question. Well, I want to keep following on from these two. 
Um, but um, as they both implied, social media interactions of employees at work, it comes down to basic HR. You know, did someone write a letter to the editor and flame about things and, and share things that weren't true about the company? It all goes back to your existing policies. And that's one of the cores of, of creating a, a social media policy for any organization is you have to go back and look to see what policies do we have in place about sharing confidential information, about non-disclosure, about using company resources during company time, how you conduct yourself in the public, what you can and can't do in talking about the company. Because anything you do related to social media has to be in absolute alignment so that there's no irregularity. And when things do come up, you know, as our HR consultants share with our clients, is like, okay, firing is not on the table right now. Let's look at the situation. Let's look at all your existing policies. Let's look at the employee's behavior and, and make a decision that, you know, warrants it. So um, it it's definitely has to be in alignment with, all, with what's already there. That's one of the big takeaways that I, you know, like people to, to have this evening. And just going way back to the NLRB uh, case that, Connie brought up, in that, in that situation where the person posted and other people liked it and chimed in, that's in the eyes of the NLRB, that's what was considered concerted protected activity is that it's employees getting together to discuss their work conditions and the terms of their employment. If this person had posted it and nothing but crickets, this probably wouldn't have happened. It would have been, okay, this is an individual gripe, someone flamed. Um, the policy says you can't do that and, you know, might not have been, it might not have come up uh, in favor of the board. So the NLRB, it's, it's interesting, just in the last several months has started to weave its way into social media policy and saying that, okay, these policies that maybe w were valid a year or two ago, maybe they're not so valid now. So you might have had a policy that said, okay, you can't use the company's logo, photos of the company, photos of employee in any of your posts in social media. You just can't publicly do it for your own uh, benefit or whatever you want to do with it. But the NLRB comes back and says, well, what if people are picketing in front of your company and someone wants to take a photo of people picketing in, in front of your place of employment and post it on the Internet as a way of airing employer employee grievances? Um, so for this remote possibility, now this NLRB is starting to, uh, you, you know, exert its influence on social media policy for these what if employees happen to be talking about wages and work conditions or complaining about supervisors. Okay, we have next question. When I usually make a new business contact, I add the person on LinkedIn, Twitter, and sometimes Facebook. And lots of the time, I get some uh, feedback and questions about the business on Facebook, which is and it's my private profile. So how do you interact as a company and you see people browsing on Facebook, you think it's private, but maybe it could be for business, she, uh, the person is talking to a customer. How do you deal with this? Or do you at all need to watch the, the Facebook time of your, of your people? Well, I'll comment on that. Um, surveys have shown that most companies are, in fact, watching the Facebook time of their employees. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was the Society uh, of Human Resources Management, SHRM, that did a survey, and they found that most companies uh, do monitor what their employees are doing on the various social media platforms. And so how, how does that impact how a company might, in other words, he's representing his organization, he tries to keep his Facebook private, but he may or may not have full control of that. So how should an employee react to that circumstance? Um, you know, I just want to throw something out there, uh, fuel for thought. I, I think that it's with social media, it's real easy to confuse the medium with the message. And even though social media is changing the way that people interact with each other, the medium is not the message. So I think it, part of it, and maybe the lawyers can ex expand on this thought, but um, the medium is not the message. The fact that it was done on Facebook, this is still a public place. What was the message? What was the harm? What was against 
the company policy. I mean, obviously, if there's a non-disclosure agreement in the employment contract and someone puts something on their Facebook page, like let's say I work for the CIA or the FBI and I put something up there that was, you know, a threat to Homeland Security, I'm, I'm in big trouble. And it doesn't matter if I did it in the privacy well, of my Facebook page, does it? What if it's not about your employer? You have a private Facebook page, your comments and tweets or whatever. I, well, let me just ask, in, in what capacity are, are you you're asking this as an employee who is interacting with third parties? Um, actually, I'm on my own, but I see that I'm doing, I'm okay. receiving business inquiries over my Facebook account, which so, is my private place where uh -huh. I'm really private and run sometimes and all this stuff. Uh, Understood. I'm replying to people sitting in companies, and right now I'm tweeting, hey, I'm at the social media club Hawaii, and all the guys in Germany are sitting at the office desk, and maybe asking me, do you want to make a, a recap of the conference maybe next week when you're back in Germany? Uh -huh. So this is a public uh, business request. Uh -huh. And so probably this person will check out my Hawaii work pictures or whatever. So, and when the bus is coming over, to this person will be asking, are you walking? Um, I'm uh, checking out a person for the meetup next week. How do you want to explain this to your boss? I, I think you're touching upon um, what, what, what we were kind of hint on, and this is more of a where marketing has to sit down with HR and figure out where they move with this kind of process. Um, you know, if, you, if you're doing it internally with marketing, and, and I know a lot of companies do this, they, they hire young 20-year-olds because they grew up with social media and everything, and that's how they fashion their social media marketing plan, not realizing that these younger employees are actually using their own personal accounts. Um, mm -hmm. This is a discussion that management and leadership needs to take and figure out where they want to go with their social media marketing plan rather than here's a computer, here's a Twitter account, have fun. Um, no. You, you, it, it's really bad when the employee or even if it's an independent contractor is taking over your marketing. You're losing control of your brand and you're losing control of what's being said. And um, I know David and I want to get to this because there's a case that perfectly dovetails into this and it's called a phone dog that happened I believe in November or December. Um, what it was is, is that a, a company had hired an independent contractor, a social media marketer to do their marketing plan and everything. And they didn't, this is why, this is why lawyers love things that are written because they didn't have a written agreement. Um, short, the short part of the story is, is they got fed up with each other and he departed. But he took the account with him. All this, so he took the Twitter account, which maybe had, I think, 20,000 followers. Um, for those of you who understand Twitter, trying to build that back up is, yeah, that's not going to happen for a while. Um, they're suing him back to get the account back, but these are kind of, uh, this is the other part of the policies that you need to have HR and marketing kind of figure out when you do your job description and you have them sign non-disclosure agreements and non-compete clauses um, where you want to go with this. It's, it, it's not just, oh, we'll hire some young person and they'll, they'll know what to do. In fact, that's probably the worst idea that you could have. As a matter of fact, there's uh, three pending cases that involve the same scenario. Uh, two of them, uh, there was no written agreement. That's the phone dog and Eagle versus Morgan. But the third one, Artist Health versus Nankaville, there was a written agreement and the court did enforce it. So the company did get to keep the Twitter account even though the person claimed that it was her own. And the other piece of this, um, what the companies involved here are complaining about is really two things. Number one, that the employee or independent contractor took the Twitter account, which is a big deal. And secondly, that they're having to spend thousands of dollars in attorney fees to litigate 
to get the list back or to litigate the resolution of the dispute. Another way around avoiding the thousands of dollars of attorney fees piece of it, so you have the written agreement to deal with the first part of it, a way to avoid the thousands of dollars of attorney's fees is also to include in this person's social media policy that you tailor exactly for them that all disputes related to ownership and use of the account must go to binding arbitration and, and not litigation. And courts have been enforcing those binding arbitration clauses in employment contracts. So. I had an interesting conversation a couple weeks ago with a gentleman named Jeremiah Owen. Some of you might know his name. He's a um, partner at the Altimeter Group. We were talking about this very same case. In the case of the Altimeter Group, they purposely have hired influencers in the social media space, people who already had significant reputations before they were hired. So how does a company like that deal with it? So it's an interesting small piece of case information because in their case, and maybe Ryan, you can speak to this just a little bit, what they've done is created essentially carve-outs for their employees. So they already had existing blogs, that information is still relevant to their personal reputations, their personal identity. And by the way, if you don't think this matters, you will be you will be faced at some point with hiring a quote unquote social media influencer. Oh, you know, I'd like to jump right in on that, Tara, because uh, uh, I have some information that was gathered from uh, Cisco, did um, something called the Connected World Technology Report. And some of the information from here was pretty astonishing. Okay, they talk a lot about the modern mobile workforce, and Connie mentioned the millennials, and you're talking about influencers and people that are already all over. Um, They're very tech savvy, and they're very social media connected. And this is going to continue to grow, and it also means that continuation, increased melding between the personal and professional lives of the workforce. 60% of the organizations uh, out there have home workers now in some capacity, and that's forecast to grow to 80% by 2013. That's next year, ladies and gentlemen. So we're really seeing the emergence of this flex jobs, and this is what young workers are looking for. And as forward-thinking companies like Cisco are taking advantage of, you know, the web and the mobile devices and telecommuting, uh, they're looking for ways to increase the productivity, but it's also posing a lot of challenges now within the workspace. And I think that's where you're going with that thought, is that if you're going to hire these people... Um, and these, and they want to have access to social media. They value that. In fact, a lot of them would, uh, would pref- you know, prefer having all of these little devices and, and more flexibility and mobility in their jobs to a higher paycheck. Yeah. So they're very attractive employees, but as they're out there, uh, and it could pose a whole new level of right. liability exposure, okay, and different challenges in the workspace than what we're accustomed to. So it'll be very interesting to see to see where this goes because it's just going to get bigger and more. And they're creating they're creating professional reputations for themselves. They're creating content, which even if you put a disclosure on your blog that says this does not reflect the opinions of my employer, which people can do very easily, there is there is still a connection. So. Ryan, can you? I, I think he touched upon it a little bit with the disclaimer there, but uh, Tara is absolutely right. If you're going around headhunting for these influencers and they've built this kind of personal cachet or reputation, like they're the king of Yelp or something like that, they, um, you know, and you hire them and you're a restaurant or something like that, and you're using them to kind of create this kind of bigger than life reality, you may be running afoul with the uh, the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC's endorsement policies on guidelines for, uh, it was mainly for blogs, but you know, it applies to social media in general. Um, you have to disclose when you are an employee and then you're boosting saying, oh yeah, this is when you're giving an endorsement, like saying that this is the best product, this is the best service, but you know, if it's their personal blog, but yet they're an employee trying to traffic their employer, it's kind of like, wait a minute, no, it, it, yeah. So you I mean those are the kind of concerns that you should think about when you try and grab these people. You want somebody to give you a plan that says, 
I'm going to create something, momentum internally and not just use myself, but I'm going to give you something, some concrete kind of plan to go forward in building your social media presence rather than just merely you um, jumping on their ship and blowing yourself up that way. I think that's what's also interesting about the Bungrad case, which is the gentleman claimed that the reason that they had such a large following was because he was being personable and himself. And that that was in part the reason for the large following, which there's something to be said for that. There's a fine line between the person speaking as themselves and then the voice of the brand. It's not an easy distinction all the time. And so this whole idea of ownership with, with accounts, it, it's not just ownership of accounts, but helping your employees uh, understand the voice and what's expected of them as they speak under your company's, company's policy. I think it, this is very, very, very interesting to me because uh, it goes back to the fact that this isn't just a marketing issue, it's not just an HR issue, we're talking about training, we're talking about customer service, we're talking about a bunch of different policies. I'm walking to Derek because we have a question from the live stream, sorry, go on. No, I'd like to uh, I'd like to add something to that thought too, Tara. Um, I was at the American Staffing Association conference in uh, New Orleans. This relates as it relates to staffing agencies and recruiters. Whether you're in a corporate environment or whether you're in a recruitment firm, they're relying more and more on LinkedIn for sourcing, right? Identifying pot potential candidates. In many ways, LinkedIn is a database and. Staffing agencies have a database too, right? They have resumes that they store. So the question became, who owns that database? And it's very much like that phone dog situation. So if you have a recruiter, maybe they join the company and they have, you know, several thousand LinkedIn connections. Who owns that data now? Right? Or maybe I join the company and I'm sourcing all these candidates and I'm connecting with all these people on LinkedIn and then I leave the company. Does the company own my connections because I built that network on their time? These ground rules need to be established going in. My uh, philosophy about social media policies is, can be summed up in four letters, K-I-S-S, -S, <laughs> KISS. Keep it short and simple. Uh, so a social media policy does not have to be long. It does not have to be long. It doesn't have to be convoluted. It does not have to be and should not be written in legalese. Uh, we, I did pass out on the table, there's a copy of a social media policy that I pulled down off of the uh, Manpower website. Uh, it was written by lawyers, so you can tell from it that it was. Um, and it's very good, really. Uh, I would just recommend that it be, that your social media policy not be so many words. It doesn't have to be so wordy. It doesn't have to be con uh, complicated. You want to have it such that everyone can read it and understand and if they don't understand the policy tells them who to go to with their questions so that they can understand. Brian? Yeah, for a small company like that, I mean you definitely are in the, in the trench part of creating and developing your marketing and this is where I go back to what I said, your inside should match your outsides. If if your customers and stakeholders know that you're a fun, outgoing, kind of young, hip kind of company, you're, they're already going to have this perception that your workers are kind of like that as well. 
And I absolutely agree with Connie. As an attorney, don't write your social media policy and legalese, because then I gotta drag it into evidence and, and defend that. Oh, a lay person, of course, can understand this, and it's kind of like written with, uh, you know, multisyllabic words, and I'm like, I have no idea what this is referring to. But yeah, it is really keep it simple and keep it short and make it understandable, and that's where the education and training comes in too. And keep it flexible too, because. Things are constantly changing. Work societies continue to change. So whatever you create, make it organic so that you know every six months you can take a look at it and say, well, things have changed. New regulations. There's something new happening. I have a question related to the sample policy. In the back it says the blank department. Which department typically reviews that? Is that the HR department or the marketing department? Because we're having that issue in our office right now where the marketing goes out look at that stuff and HR is going, I don't have time. So. Well, well, you get the same. <laughs> the same goes with that blank. I would put HR and marketing. If you have a marketing department, there's no, so there's, there's nothing written in blood here. This, you get to create it. You start with a blank piece of paper or a blank computer screen and then you create it. And so however you want it to be is what it, it can be. I mean, and there are some, in my opinion, five things that you need to include uh, but, you know, as you can see, I made this in large font, and it didn't even take up half the page. So you have room to add other things. I, oh, I, I think, you know, going back to your question, in, uh, avoiding internal office politics, um, you know, I think what you really need to do is go back to leadership. I mean, they're going to define the corporate culture and set the standards, and they will firmly place, place it in either or they're going to say, the leader of marketing and the leader of HR sit down and craft the policy. Ooh, I'm sorry. Anyway, yeah. Um, so, I, you know, you need to hold leadership and say you need to get involved with this because this is a this is a, a huge concern or could be. I, I'm going to put forth an idea that I've been tiptoeing around, just a whole other session in itself. But a lot of companies that are dealing with this very issue are putting together circles of excellence or some other corporate-esque term that includes representatives from a multiple, from a, a lot of different segments of the business: HR, marketing, customer service, uh, you know, legal. So that all those people have a place at the social media table, and no one person is necessarily in charge of every piece of it. That also enables companies to be able to uh, make their policy that is consistent with corporate culture, but suits the needs of, of the various different departments. You're seeing a lot of that now. Bigger companies are doing that. I put forth that medium-sized companies and even companies that have people that do HR and marketing in the same job can benefit from that kind of a model because you, you, you have the advantage of seeing a bunch of different perspectives. So we have 10 minutes. I, I asked the panelists, does anybody else have any other questions right now? All right. I asked the panelists to come up with two things that they would say are must-haves within your social media policy. And I'm start with you, David, and we're going to go to the left and then finish with Sylvia. Go ahead. I already touched on the two things that would be most important from our point of view, and that would be make sure it's consistent with all your existing policies. And, and one of the first things you can do, I think, the way Tara had phrased the question is, what do you do tomorrow if you want to start down this path? Dust off all your old policies and go through them to see if all of them are up to date, your email policy, your computer systems, Internet use policy. Dust those off, review them, and make sure that whatever you create is in alignment with what you've already got. Uh, and the other thing is stay on top of what the NLRB is doing because they're the only ones that are venturing out to really define what's going on in the workplace as it relates to social media. And um, like the report that came out just last month, um, you know, is very specific about language they think is appropriate and language they think is just uh, too, too broad. I'm going to put that information, by the way, up on the blog post that we put up after, after tonight. One of the policies. Go ahead, Ryan. Um, two things. You know, I, I, you know Dave, David actually kind of took mine, so <laughs> but that's okay. Um, I, 
I was going to say that, yes, you actually should, I, I wholeheartedly agree, you should dust off your old policies. And going back to what Connie said earlier, your social media policy doesn't need to be this whole new monster or beast. It actually may dovetail already into your electronic and email kind of policies that you already have on hand. That being said, those probably need to be updated. The second thing is, is you know, I, I would just go out if you're a larger company and just kind of f test the waters and see what's out there already if you don't have a social media policy and see what kind of internal feedback you get from your workers and stuff like that. Because remember, when you implement the policy, you're going to have to be educating them on the policy if you don't have one. So you kind of want to test at what level they are. Because you can always do, you can always change your policy. It's kind of like the rising tide thing. You start off with the base and then you slowly implement and get to where you want to go with that policy. Not, we have to start here and then you're going to end up firing or antagonizing your whole worker pool. Uh, the two things to do tomorrow are to, number one, develop or update, and two, train, 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 train. <laughs> um, well, my one takeaway, remember the three M's. Okay. <laughs> I would say treat uh, social media as you would a public place and that that's kind of a good rule of thumb. Things are going to be litigated, but I think that's what it's going to come down to. You'll have a code of conduct that will apply to public places and that your social policy should kind of spring from that as well as your existing policies on internet communication in general. And then back to what Connie had said, communicate it well, use a little common sense, don't make it difficult for people to understand, put it in plain language so that people know what the rules are. And if they break the rules, uh, you can escalate it, but don't fire them right away. Help educate them and let them understand what the rules are and just don't overreact, <laughs> I guess. Well, that's the third thing, don't overreact. <laughs> Okay, so let me recap. Review. Stay up to date on the latest trends. Um, make your policies uh, consistent with the culture of your company, whatever that culture is. Uh, and remember that you can escalate both your policies and the implementation of those policies. In other words, they can be progressive, that not everything deserves to be fired right away. And then we also talked a lot tonight about common sense, and traditional old manners. And I think that, that kind of sums it up. Did I miss anything, you guys? Okay. So that's awesome because that dovetails into the book drawing we're going to have tonight. And if you didn't put your business card in there, you have about four seconds to get your business card in there. <laughs> tonight's, uh, tonight's book is uh, by a woman named Sandy Carter. She works at this dinky little company called IBM. <laughs> They happen to be a leader in the social media space, largely because of Sandy's work. But one of the things that Sandy says is that culture trumps policy every single time. Yeah. So if you're, Ryan said this, your inside should manage your outsides. That has to do with social media transparency. We see it in action. We see it, we hear it over and over again in a bunch of different ways. But Sandy also implements that with social media. And I want to thank my, our panelists. If you guys have any other questions, feel free to stick around. But thank you very much, you guys. Brilliant. You got way to the answers of the questions, way before I can answer them. You guys rock. Thank you very much. Don't forget to pick up some of the, the flyers on the way out. We're also going to post digital copies.